A maze of lanes link the houses that are scattered sparsely about these fields, and the lanes wander into one another like streams until they reach some main road. These narrow lanes are still in use. In places, the hedges that grow on the high banks along the lanes are so wild that the trees join and tangle above them to form a roof. And in the full leaf of summer, it is like walking through a green tunnel pierced by vivid pinpoints of light. I came back to live among these lanes 30 years ago. My wife and I were beginning our life together and we thought we could make a bare living on these small fields and I would write. It was a time when we could have settled almost anywhere, and if she had not liked the place and the people, they would have moved elsewhere. I too liked the place, but I was from these fields, and my preference was less important. Well, John Bignetta was a man I suppose we took for granted a good deal uh, when he was alive, and uh, when he was dead, of course, we're all honour honour him. But uh, he had seen him around the town here, the same as you would in Mohol, and uh, I think he tended to go to Mohol more than Man more. But he'd be here often enough, you'd see him up at Pat Max Garage or in different places. And uh, he, he, he was regarded very much as an ordinary person because he was very easy to talk to, and he wouldn't be talking with books or literature. Now you could ask him about him, all right, but he'd, uh, he wouldn't dwell on it very much. And it was only when something would come up like a new book or a programme on radio or television, and we say, Christ, that man is living here, sir. Sure. John was at ease, as I said, with, with, with farming and country people and country ways and country scenes. And it wasn't just that he put it on to be a part of it. He, he was naturally at home with his cattle and on his land, and that's where he drew his strength from and his great stories from. I remember being in his company one night, and we talked about uh, his last, or his second last book, rather, uh, that they may face the rising sun. And uh, somebody in the story was um, explaining to Rutledge about John Quinn's first night with his new woman. And uh, the way he described him having a good time was he described it as in and out all night of a most happy future. And uh, even John would tell that so many times, he would still throw back his head and laugh at the idea of it. Now that's probably a line he picked up and made his own of it someplace. But he enjoyed it and to the day he died, even though as I said he wrote it, read it, heard it read or whatever, he still enjoyed it to that extent. And when he was in the company of people, let it be in Callaghan Simone or Luke Earley's or a pub in Ballymore or wherever he was, um, he enjoyed their company uh, for their little ways of telling things and that was his gift that he could remember then and make his own of it. What is a masterpiece, Sean? Uh, and he says, a masterpiece is the correct distribution of ink and the correct number of white pages. <laughs> Tonight we're coming to you from Carrick and Shannon in County Leitrim, the home of writer John McGarren, who died last year. The occasion of the inaugural John McGarren International Seminar a joint initiative of Inuwe Galway's English Department and Leitrim County Council. John Garn was born here in South Leitrim, and the landscape and the people of this place permeates his stories, novels, and memoirs. Very much an honour to have been asked to give this talk in memory of my beloved teacher and friend. Um, whenever Keith Richards gets up to perform as lead guitarist with the Rolling Stones, he always says, first of all, it's great to be here. And then he adds as a cautious afterthought, come to think of it, it's great to be anywhere. <laughs> and um, John, John had a rather similar line whenever he sat down to a meal with us. He used to, you know, if we began complaining about things like the rain or the spitefulness of neighbors or the treachery of old friends, he would look and say, oh yeah, all that's true. But on the other hand, isn't it amazing that we're here at all? <laughs> Whenever a major author in Ireland dies, one of two things happens. Either the reputation drops when they're no longer around to promote it, and that has happened sadly to some very good people, or else, and John said this about one or two of his friends, including a poet from a nearby county, or else, he says, it rises immeasurably because they're no longer around to damage it. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's been gone now for over a year. His resting place in Ockawillan, 
with his beloved mother, has become, I am told, a place of pilgrimage. It seems to be a cross between a West of Ireland pattern day and the kind of devotions offered at the grave of Jim Morrison uh, in Père Lachaise in Paris. I think that John would have had something wry, sardonic, and even self-effacing to say about all that, because he was a truly humble man. Um, doubtless, many of the pilgrims are praying for the peaceful repose of his soul in ways that the author of the country funeral could only honour and respect. And I'm sure many also are coming to honour an honest craftsman, someone whose work was always done to the highest standard in the best tradition of rural Irish carpentry, bricklaying, and general crafts. Um, the, the first book of John's I heard of was The Barracks, and it was actually my aunt Maura who had it in the house, because I was, of course, a student, a pupil of John's at Belgrove School in Clontarf, as were my cousins, the Dolans, and my aunt Maura actually read his book. She was a great reader of contemporary Irish novels, and I suddenly realised that this man who was teaching us had a whole different secret life. And I was beginning to be a reader myself, so that was fascinating. And then the controversial circumstances in which he left a few years later added a whiff of glamour and also of the forbidden uh, to all that. Um, I think the other book I was very aware of, and this would have been just after my student years in Trinity, uh, around about the early to mid-1970s, was The Leave Taking. And that was almost narcissistic, I have to admit, because the first half of that book is set in my old primary school. It's all about John's dismissal from Belgrove. And there are fabulous descriptions, very minute and exact, not just of the mannerisms of our old headmaster, Mr. Kelleher, but of what the playground was like, especially when the seagulls from Dublin Bay wheeled over it, looking for stray crusts after the boys had finished their lunches. There's a wonderful description of a local sweet shop we all went to after school which was called the Bon Bon. It was run by a woman called Miss Hayden. And it was over the fridge in that shop that Mr. Kelleher had first offered John the job and then had to break to him years later the awful news that the job was no longer his. The Archbishop John Charles McQuaid used his influence to ensure that McGahern was removed from his teaching position. Not only had he written what McGahern would refer to humorously later as a dirty book, but he had also had the temerity to get married in a registry office to a Finnish woman, Anniki Latsi. And that made his position completely uh, untenable. Brought up in the Catholic faith by a pious, devout mother and a father whom he described as very outwardly religious, McGovern couldn't have avoided the presence of religion in his life. His memory was saturated with religious truths and rituals. As he wrote in the essay, uh, The Church and the Spire, which was published in 1993, and I quote from it, All this was learned at home. The lamp that burned day and night before the sacred heart on the high mantelpiece. The silence that fell when the Angelus rang. The story of Christ as a story that gave meaning to our lives through the great feast of Christmas and Easter and Whitsun. The father is probably the first love of a girl and the mother of a boy. Um, and um, is that uh, because there were so many children who came so quickly, there was four of us in three years, I think, um, is that she used to take me before I was at school going age to school with her. And we used to walk with him to school and um, often um, walking in similar places over the years, I got this very a uh, strange feeling of uh, uh, peace and uh, happiness and almost a feeling that you could live forever of extraordinary well-being and uh, eventually I traced it back to those walks uh, uh, to Lizzie Carlin's school with my mother where she'd name uh, the wild flowers and sometimes we'd pick the flowers for the jam jars in the school. This is a Hawilan National School which was built in 1933, the year before John McGahern was born. John went to school here for about three years of his life, from about the age of seven to about the age of ten. His mother was teaching here in this school, and this is the last school that his mother taught in. Uh, she died uh, while she was uh, a, a permanent member of the staff here. After uh, the mother died, John left uh, Ahwillan and went to live in the barracks in Goodhall. 
but John writes in his memoir quite a lot about coming from his house in Curramahan, coming up this lane here behind us and uh, coming to school here and also going to Mass in Ahuilin Church, which is just up the road from here. I'm from Balahadrine in County Roscommon. He came originally from near French Park and uh, he was from Coote Hall. And uh, that wasn't very far away from, from where I was from. And the idea of a book being written about a place so close to home fascinated me uh, for a start. And then the book itself absolutely gripped me because of the topic and the, the sadness of it and the bleakness of it, which you could relate to at that time, late 60s, early 70s, uh, Northwest was common. It just echoed so accurately the reality of life there. The story itself was a very sad story, the story of the death of his mother, which we know now to be true. But um, at the time, that was, uh, it wasn't as clear he was writing about his mother. The window of the sick room opened and the nurse motioned to me to come to the room. It could not be put off any longer. Inside the house looked much larger, emptied of all the furniture. In a terrible numbness I climbed the stairs, crossing the landing by the open doors of the small empty bedrooms, entered the room and went towards the bed. Maggie and the nurse were in the room. The lorry would be gone soon, Mammy. Not for a little time yet, love. Her voice was so low I was hardly able to hear. I came to say goodbye, Mammy. Her eyes were fixed on my face. She seemed to be very tired. I bent to kiss her. She did not move. I was bewildered. But Maggie and the nurse turned away. I tried to hurry. If I did not get away quickly, I'd never be able to walk out of the room. I wanted to put my arms around the leg of the bed so that they wouldn't be able to drag me away and be, they'd be forced to leave me with her in the room forever. I went out the door, crossed the landing, went down the stairs and out into the blinding day. Listen, the man's reputation is only beginning to grow. It had begun to grow with, uh, amongst women in 1990 uh, at home. Uh, he was acclaimed uh, in the latter years, the latter two decades approximately of his life, uh, sealed really by a uh, memoir, a beautiful piece of work which seemed to confirm that there was a strong autobiographical flavour to everything he wrote. And um, he's a huge following in France, particularly. I think his reputation will grow as time goes on, as it will become another academic industry, as we have with other Irish writers. Whether he'll ever be as big as James Joyce is another matter entirely, I don't know. But I really don't care. It's a he's a different type of writer entirely, which I, who would have, I'd say, a much broader public appeal uh, than, than a purely academic appeal, which is the case with a lot of Joyce, Joyce scholarship. In 1993, the barracks was placed on the syllabus for the Agrégation en Capes, the competitive exam which is held each year to recruit secondary school English teachers in France. It meant that all English departments all over the country had to organize courses on Bangarang that year. It was also a great opportunity for those same departments to invite Bangarang to give conferences. And that year, he went on a veritable tour de France, which I hope he went without taking any drugs. <laughs> it, was, it was a great occasion for me to meet him, to hear him talk, and even to ask him a few questions. We noticed very quickly that he had a very special way of avoiding making straight answers to the students' questions. Usually replying with a joke or a quip, and always suggesting that his job was merely to write the stories and that it was our job to explain what he had meant or how he had managed to mean anything. I was lucky to be given some time to have a conversation with him and I soon discovered that behind the facade of the countryman he liked to offer to the world, as when he would talk of his farm and his cows, etc., there was an extremely refined and cultivated man of letters. For example, as I reminded him of his meeting my father-in-law at Colgate University, he casually mentioned his friendship with American writer Rem Carver and the correspondence he had with him after that. He had met him while uh, going uh, duck shooting with him uh, during one of his stays in America. After the talk that he gave that day, a colleague of mine and myself drove McGarren back to the station and I still keep an image of him 
walk, walking away, the very picture of the Irish countryman wearing a large, indefinite raincoat and carrying a plastic carrier bag in his hand. There was an evening of um, Irish artists, writers and so on in Paris and um, John was there and uh, there were very few Irish people living in Paris at the time and um, we decided as we would do as Irish people do when they're abroad to uh, go up to him after the little presentation and we had a most uh, remarkable conversation with him um, and in fact I think not alone did it lead me to uh, try to explore John McGarren a little bit more but it actually took me ultimately to live in Leitrim um, the journey from France took me through Belgium and, Ar and Dublin and then ultimately to Leitrim. And it's in the churchyard and the graveyard of Ardcairn Church that John's father is buried and his stepmother. So. Uh, we have we have the, the, the burial place of, of his father behind us. We have a place where he. Wine River is about 17 miles long. The midpoint of it is Loch Key. It rises in Loch Gara. Uh, in South County Sligo, close to the villages of Monstraden and Gurchin. As the Boyle River comes into Loch Key and then leaves Loch Key, for, for people like ourselves who are interested in John McGahern, we're, we're reaching sort of the holy ground, really. In John's novels, we could read about places, or we could pretend to ourselves, or presume to ourselves that we knew places, or we could pick out places, or maybe even people, within the lines of his works. But it, it wasn't really until memoir was published that he gave us sort of clear, reliable information on how important some places and some people were to him. The best times were the days he took me on the river in the tarred boat. I'd hold the lines while he rode. In the silence, I'd hear my sister's cries from the barracks, now uninhibited in their play. I could hear a pipe on his motorbike coming up from Morden's Bay, he would say, when he was in good humour. Often the river seemed to liberate him from himself, but those moments were fragile. Tangled lines or a sudden slip of the tongue could cause the whole day to unravel. But fraught as they, as they sometimes were, those outings were my introduction to the river, which became in the years ahead both an escape and a blessed need. He lived in the barracks, which was 20 miles away in Coote Hall. We were afraid of him, and um, I think, um, I remember uh, once trouble because uh, he um, used a knife uh, to take some uh, childish uh, scabs off my face. On the day before the leaving cert, he wanted to get away and escape. So where did he go to but the river? And he writes, um, The day before the exam was an intensification of the same. A Sunday, hot and without a breeze. With Joan, I went on the river in the old tarred boat, the tar melting and smelling in the heat, and I had to pour water over the squealing roan pins. She let out the spoons, and I rode at slow trawling speed. The summer of 1987, I was waiting for my leaving search results when my brother handed me a copy of a book I hadn't seen before by an author I'd never heard of. Young Mahoney's Troubles in the Dark somehow made my own anxiety yeah. far less. And uh, it, it began a fascination with McGarren, which continued into college when I got an opportunity to, to see John McGarren read in my, my first year. For John McGarren, all that mattered ultimately was uh, the, the writer alone in a room and the reader alone with a book. Um, the, the solitary reader was the person who brought the books alive again. Um, as Eamon Maher said last night, uh, using a, a, a phrase from Joyce, uh, the book is a coffin of words until it's opened up by the reader. 
that was all that mattered to John McGarry, creating the world of his imagination and giving other people the opportunity to bring that world back to life in a different way uh, through, their, through their own uh, personal vision, through their own lives. I wrote him a letter um, to ask, and I remember <laughs> very craftily, I was living in Dublin at the time, but I put my Longford address on the letter because I thought I might stand more of a chance of actually getting an interview with him. And I wrote him a letter saying, you know, why I wanted to interview him and that stressing that I didn't want to talk about his life, I wanted to talk about his work. And um, I'd get, and I think he wrote back to me very briefly and said that he, he would be happy to talk to me and would I give him a call. Um, so I called him, I remember calling him from Trinity, and I was so nervous that instead of asking him if he'd be, I meant to say, would you be interested in an interview, I accidentally said, would you be interested in an interview? And <laughs> cue mortification, uh, but he was, um, he, he laughed and we made an arrangement, met in the Longford Arms Hotel two days later. We took tea in a room upstairs and I just, he was so mischievous, he was looking over my shoulder the whole time at a couple behind us who were having a row and he was just getting great pleasure out of this, um, not out of the row, but out of the, um, you know, the, basically it was, it was gossip and it was a story and I could see his eyes working on that story as, as we were talking and you knew, you felt like, like when you were talking to him that he was seeing right into you and he knew everything about you. His fiction, I suppose, had trained me for that. Despite all of that, it was a really pleasant experience and we stayed in touch and then became friends and that was very special to me. fascinated with the idea of the leave taking being rewritten in the light of the French translation. So I, um, I read it and I read the translations and then I read the leave taking amongst women and then I got very, very interested in both the writer and the man. And I suppose he spoke to me in a way that he speaks to a lot of his readers that I saw a lot of my own native North Tipperary in the landscape and in the characters. I saw a lot of my father's generation in, in, in the characters as well. So there was an automatic um, sort of fusion of interests and um, that's, that's the roundabout way I came to his writing. Leitrim and the North West form a unique and important backdrop to the McGarren canon. We in Inuag always share in this geography, and by becoming the home for the papers of John McGarren, we in a very real way maintain for this region an enduring link with the writer and the man. These last three days have been marvellous in that we've had these eminent academics down here and pointing out some of the sort of finer points in his work that um, I probably wouldn't have noticed um, prior to hearing them and um, that certainly added a lot of depth to it. I did graduate study and I've been to lots of conferences and this was a very different atmosphere. Everyone was there because they wanted to be there. They were all readers of the work and I think, I'm, I'm sure this event will just become massive in the years to come, but I'll always remember the first one, a very, very special weekend. I've been reading the man since I was 20, having grown up in the area, delighted, firstly that he a successful author, and more delighted that he was taking on the establishment and then suddenly to find in my latter years that I got to know the man. And all of those things have come, come together here this weekend. And I'm sure it's the start of many to go, go from here forward.